Hello, I'm Jim Deeks, and welcome to this edition of Canada Files. You know, we Canadians are very proud of many artists who have become famous in our country. But outside our borders, there aren't many who have become internationally renowned, despite the brilliance of their work. One artist who has achieved worldwide fame is our guest on this episode. His name is Edward Bertinsky, and as you'll see, his incredible talent comes from the art of photography, through which he's teaching all of us about the effect we're having on our planet. But before we start, I want to give you a taste of what Bertinsky's art and passion involve. Landscapes, yes, but also evidence of the impact and destruction of mankind. Mountains of garbage, massive oil fields, rusted manufacturing plants, deep rock quarries that from a distance look like brilliant and compelling abstract art until you get up close and see what Ed's eye and his camera see. It's just stunning work. Edward Bertinsky, welcome. You are in your studio in Toronto, and we are in our studio, basically just around the corner from you, but we are separated because of, obviously, pandemic precautions. And actually, just talking about the pandemic, you know, for someone who's spent the better part of the last 40 years traveling to all four corners of the earth in search of unique scenes to photograph, I assume that the last several months of pandemic travel restrictions must have been driving you crazy. Uh, well, Jim, I'd like to say it has, but uh, it hasn't actually, because I've um, traveled so much that I would, you know, I think maybe half of my year is on a jet or in some foreign country uh, dealing with all the issues of access and uh, et cetera. So actually having this last year uh, pretty much, you know, forcing me to be at home has actually been a welcome respite. And, and uh, it's also forced me to kind of get back to basics and just me, the camera, uh, going for walks, uh, going into my you know, truck up north and driving around and seeing what I can see and producing a body of work that way, which is, uh, it was refreshing. Uh, just me, the camera, and, um, and time. Well, let's talk a little bit. Let's go back to basics. Uh, let's talk about how you got to become what you are today. You were born in St. Catharines, Ontario, which is just across Lake Ontario from Toronto, where we are now. Uh, in the mid-1950s, you know, St. Catharines is a very nice town, but I'm not sure that anybody would describe it as a hotbed of artistic photography. What got the bug in you? Uh, what created the spark of interest in photography? Well, I uh, grew up in a creative household. So my father, um, who uh, was displaced by the war and came to Canada, um, in the early 50s after the war. Uh, and he had a passion for art, painting, um, uh, photography. And I got uh, that bug from him, but he also had a real passion for the outdoors. So he loved going fishing. He loved uh, uh, going into the forest looking for mushrooms, which I did with him in the fall. Um, and so I got a lot of the outdoors with him and I got the art bug with him. And then he died when I was quite young. I, um, I was 15 when he passed away. Uh, but I carried on and I got a, my first camera when I was 11. Uh, and with that camera, I was able to go around and I could, I had, um, it's interesting, I had a 100 foot roll of film and I had a couple of those spools and I was able to peel off uh, you know, 36 exposures and the old roll of 36 and put it in a camera in black and white and then come back home after the day, process the film. And to me, the magic was that evening I'd be able to put one of those negatives in an enlarger, blow it up to an 8 by 10 and just watching it appear in that orange glow of a dark room and then fixing it and then the excitement of, of being able to make an image of a world that I was just walking around and now it's this two-dimensional representation of that place. And I used to paint before that, and I thought, man, this is so much quicker than painting, and it's so much more fun, and I can hang out with my friends, and I can still make art. And it just was always there. Never actually in St. Catharines, you're absolutely right, Jim, it wasn't the place where one launches their career as an international photographic artist. 
but um, I did have some teachers in college there that said, hey, you have a real aptitude for uh, making pictures every assignment we give you, you come back with something kind of really uh, extraordinary. Uh, you should go to Ryerson. And that's when I crossed Lake Ontario, went to Toronto, um, and in 1976, uh, started my education in photography and did a Bachelor of Arts in Photography at Ryerson University. Did you always see photography as an art form or was your initial thinking that, you know, this is a way that I can make a living? I always uh, wanted it as an art form. I did make money with it even in the early, early days. I even photographed weddings for friends and things for a few bucks. And, um, and then I worked as a, a kind of a magazine photographer for a while. And I worked at IBM as a photographer for a while. Uh, so I did all kinds of things to put myself through, but I never wanted to have my camera for hire. I always wanted to have the camera as a tool uh, for my creative outlet to, to be able to explore the world. And I think uh, as photographers and as artists, we're always trying to uh, look at reality and find the moment where it transcends that. So there's something, uh, something that, that you can't put your finger on, but it just when we stand in front of that image, it makes us kind of feel like we're transported somewhere else uh, that, that invokes that, our sense of wonder. And to me that as an artist, I'm always in search of that moment when, when the banal becomes extraordinary. When though did you sort of discover the idea that you could blend environmental subjects with photographic expression? Because that more than anything, I mean, the environment has been your trademark as a photographer. Well, it, it couldn't have happened if it wasn't that love of nature to begin with. So I had to really, you know, engage, be in the forest, understand it, go fishing, to go camping. So as soon as I uh, got my license to drive at 16, the, the first thing I did is I bought a canoe uh, and my friend had a car and we went up north and we went camping. And I think it's that uh, understanding of that place where... Um, in a way, we get to see what nature intended for the planet. And I wanted to say something about that, and I kept photographing that pristine landscape. But after a while, I kept, kept thinking, well, if I want to be a contemporary of my time, um, this felt too nostalgic for me. It felt like a yearning for this kind of untrammeled world that, 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 that was there, this notion of a paradise lost, and I'm trying to refine it. But I had a, an opportunity as I put myself through school. I was able to get jobs in GM and in the mining companies up in the north that paid really well. And it was looking at those places that eventually I thought, well, maybe it's not going to the pristine landscape that is true to my time. It's actually going to the place where we transform that landscape because what I'm Witnessing at that time, even in the early 80s, the projections for human population growth were spiking and, and, and it was unprecedented. So we were in this unprecedented moment where the human populations were going to be on this exponential curve. And I was looking at resources and I'm thinking, well, as we you know, become more uh, on this planet, we're going to be using iron ore more, we're going to be using copper more, we're going to be using trees more, we're, and we live in a finite planet. So even in the early 80s, I realized that by locking on to that idea and just continually trying to find a new way to express that idea, that eventually the compendium of work that would, that would grow out of that would somehow be the, a portrait of how we as a species using technology has tra have transformed uh, the planet. So if I was trying to tell um, an intelligent species on another planet what we're up to, I would say, well, we've, de we've discovered technology uh, and we have developed consciousness and now we are using our technology to extract all the necessary things to build our metropolitan cities and to live the lives and transport us around the way we do today. So that would be the big uh, kind of thing that I would want to tell another intelligent species about what we're up to here 
on the planet. But you've also shown those of us still on Earth that we are desecrating the planet to a great degree. I wanted to ask you though, and I'm sure this is a question you get asked every time you step out the door in the morning by somebody, how do you find the photographs, the, the locations that you do? Because in the 40 years since the early 80s that you were just mentioning, you literally have gone to almost every corner of the earth. You've been to some of the remotest places on the planet how do you find these places? I mean, I assume you don't wake up in the morning and say, I think I'll go to Nigeria today and see what I can shoot. Well, very true. Uh, but it certainly got a lot easier with the, uh, with the, with the World Wide Web and the Internet and, and Google Earth uh, and all that. But pre that, it, it was hard. Like, I, like one of my early subjects was quarries. I went, well, how do I find the big quarries in the world? So, uh, you know, I went to the Toronto Reference Library and I looked up um, magazines for, you know, qu quarry, people in the quarry business. And they had, you know, quarry conferences. And I'd look up the magazines and I'd find people who sold equipment to people who ran quarries. And so it was a whole other way of, of you know, going to the stacks and looking at cards and finding magazines and taking notes and, and then, you know, calling them up on long distance and paying for it and saying, you know, eventually finding my way to Vermont. And, and then, then once I'm there, I have to talk my way into the quarry. So it was a very different way of working pre-internet than, than post-internet. With post-internet, then I can research. And, and it was always going, you know, for me, it was how do you go from a general idea like quarries or, or copper mines or whatever, to the specific place in the world. And the one thing that I kept doing in, in, in how to define that is I looked for uh, like quarries or mines that have been around for a long time, that were still very productive and, and, and going, and that, uh, that they were the largest examples of you know, mining or quarrying. So that was always, you know, like if I, if I thought of copper mines, well, there are probably, you know, 25,000 copper mines around the world. Well, which one? Why? And it would say, okay, which is the biggest copper mine in the world? And then I would go there. And if they didn't let me in, I'd go to the second biggest copper mine in the world and try and get into there. And I'd work my way down. Usually I got it within the first or second mine, would say, okay, come on over. Let me see what you can do. When you find a location, though, is there something that you, Ed Bertinsky, can see in the shot that the rest of us mortals can't or don't see in the shot? I mean, how do you pick the place you want to snap that photograph? And I think that's, uh, yeah, it's a great question and also very rarely asked because it, it, there is something and I think, um, it, and I'm always reminded of it, that to get to that place, you really have to understand the present moment. You have to be in that moment. You have to kind of look at all of the, uh, the, the elements that are, that are at work, the light, you know, the texture, the color, the time of year. And I remember I had a, an assistant with me on a shoot early on, early on, and I was shooting 8x10, so very large negatives. So it's a big commitment at that time. Even in the 80s, it was $10 for a sheet of film and another $10 to process that film and then another $10 to make a contact sheet. So when you go click, it's like, you know, and, and this is you know, money in the 1980s, which was much more hard to come by. So you really commit. And I remember, you know, when you make a picture, it's a big commitment. I remember sitting there, you know, like for like an hour, just slowly finding on this big glass plate, just waiting for that moment. And, and at one point, you know, uh, the person with me, they, they, they said, what are you looking at? Because they were watching me at work. What are you looking at? And I said, uh, well, get up. I, well, I found a rock and I moved it over because I was, got up and looked and went, holy cow, I, didn't, I had no idea that was there. Like, so... It is the ability to kind of isolate within that landscape a moment where something occurs. And, the, and you have to attenuate, I think, your eye and your mind and all your senses, to, 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 especially your visual sense, to say, here, this, the, by isolating this, this here is the picture. Everything else becomes mundane. So 
I've learned that actually the photograph of the places I go to are almost inevitably more interesting than the place itself. When you're walking around a quarry, it just looks like a torn up landscape. But all of a sudden in there, there's a small spot where if I isolate that, some magic occurs. Again, the looking for that transcendent moment where the mundane becomes the extraordinary. I wonder with all the destruction and the garbage and uh, uh, the poverty that you've seen over these last 40 years, how has that affected you personally and even emotionally? Well, I mean, I have, um, when I was doing a lot of that work, and particularly when I went into places like India or, 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 or even China, and, to, and in India in particular, to, to see the kind of um, scant means of existence. And, and, and I had, at that time when I was shooting that, I had uh, daughters that were like, you know, two and five, there were three years between them. And when I was going into India, and I actually um, found myself in tears at times, just just thinking about these, you know, children and and the the, the incredible disadvantage they had, and trying to you know make a living and, and and having to you know beg for an existence. And it's kind of like it's you see things that you know would never ever happen here, but but yet you know that that kind of resilience, the 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 the, the human resilience and what normal uh, could be in, because one of the things that I think I saw and what I've learned about humans is we are incredibly adaptable and we can adapt to a new normal uh, faster than any other creature on the planet. Um, and when I looked at that normal, I realized how far it was from my normal. Um, and yet, it, and yet, although at the same time, there were moments I was in India and I saw it was got so hot in midday we would sit in the square near this you know quarry town and i saw the sheer joy of the people there they were all suffering in a way the same disease they, no one made more than two dollars a day they worked hard for it but but there was a kind of camaraderie there was uh, you know the girls laughing to go get the water because we were, we were at the central part of the town where there was a water well and i said to myself at one point i turned to you know my assistants and i said you know, I see more joy here in the corner than I ever could be at the corner of Spadina and King in downtown Toronto. Or, uh, it, like, they're all part of a community and they, you know, they, they work as a community and they share as a community. It is what you do with a camera still fairly unique or is there a, an Ed Bertinsky school of photography coming up you know, behind you where there are, you know, younger photographers emulating what you do? Uh, I do see uh, that there is, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, as, as, you know, uh, the world has, you know, when I was doing this, you know, 40 years ago, there weren't a lot of people, you know, you know thinking of doing a project photographing how we're transforming the planet. But I do think that now that there's an urgency, now that we see climate change is not something that's going away, it's a problem that's only going to increase. Uh, we're looking at you know, resource extraction and, and, the, and the decrease of biodiversity, all these things. And I think the youth coming up uh, and younger uh, artists and photographers want to, want to say something about that, want to take that on as a subject. And I think um, you know, and I'm not saying that I'm the first pioneer. Carlton Watkins was photographing mines back in the late 80s and uh, 18, 1800s, I should say. And, and uh, you, know, you know, even Ansel Adams had fo photographed uh, destruction and he was actually one of the pioneers. And through Watkins and Adams' work, a lot of the, uh, you know, natural forests uh, and preserves in, in you know, Yosemite and et cetera in, in, in the United States were, were created as, as a result of the images that they brought back. So, so I think uh, photography is a very powerful way to tell the story of how we're transforming this planet. Um, and I do think, and I, and I don't discourage them, I, just, I don't want them to copy exactly what I'm doing, but I don't discourage artists embracing that because I think that story needs to be told far and wide by many, many of us. And, and, 
And the more people telling that story, the, the more we can raise consciousness around the events that are occurring today on the planet. What about photography itself? It would seem that the technology of photography may well have reached its pinnacle. Would you agree with that? Or will there always be advances that will make your work either more creative or easier or more accessible? Well, I do think uh, it's, it's reached a, an apex for sure. And, and I think you know, it starts to crest. I think the technology begins to crest so that you can actually, like currently I'm working with a camera that um, is one of the best uh, uh, in the world with lenses that have been adapted and made specifically to, to, to handle that kind of a resolution at a medium format. Um, and it's a phase camera, but, but it's 150 megapixel. And I can make, in the natural order, I was making prints that were uh, 60 inches by 80 inches and um, and you could go right up to them, you know, put your face six inches away, and, and nothing breaks down. Every twig, every texture of of, of of the bark, everything is is present. It's there. It's defined. Now you can go to a 200 megapixel, and you can go to a 250, and but I think, as I say, there's a cresting, there's a plateauing that happens, and I think we're near a plateau. I think we're we're we're, we're like you can improve it but it's not going to actually make the experience of standing in front of the print all that much more noticeable. Do you still have the same fire you had 40 years ago? When you're in your 20s and 30s and you're up against incredible odds, you know, you have to have a lot of chutzpah and ambition to get past all the obstacles and, uh, and the crazy kinds of uh, uh, ways in which you had to work and the, the level. I, I can honestly say I don't have to work as hard as I did back then, and thank God I don't think I could do it. But, uh, but it still means that I think uh, uh, it's been pretty consistent that anybody I find who's, who's successful uh, uh, is not afraid of work. Um, someone once said to me, you know, uh, or once someone once said that, uh, who was very successful, says, you know, the, um, you know the, the harder I work, the more successful I get. And I think there's a truth to that, that, that you don't get there uh, by chance. It, it's because you have uh, an idea and you have the right drive and ambition and you don't give up easily. I want to ask you a question that I ask all our guests on Canada Files. And for you, uh, you're an internationally recognized artist. Uh, you've traveled the world in all four corners, as I've said. I want to ask you what being Canadian means to you. You're, you live in Toronto, you have been in this area all your life, but you're internationally recognized. Is that important to you and what does it mean to you to know that you are recognized as Canadian? Well, to me, I, I, I'm, uh, I hold that as a badge of honor to be Canadian. I do, um, I do like this country a lot. I've had all the advantages of education, of a healthcare system, uh, and um, that, that there's been opportunity in this country that I've gotten to invent myself. I started pretty much with, with nothing, so it is the start with nothing and build your life from nothing story. So. Uh, it is the Canadian dream story, and, and you know, if you look at the Great Lakes and the two million, you know, lakes north of the 49th, it's over 30 percent of the world's fresh water. We have some of the most, the vast, you know, tracts of forest that have that are still intact, uh, and that knowing that that place exists up there, uh, and that there's a lot of this thing we call nature, almost endless, is, is there. And, and that gives me some kind of comfort and, and knowledge that, that we have that and having been, been able to experience that and really feel it uh, has really also, I think, allowed me the ability to um, lament its loss and to understand what losing it means. But if you've never fallen in love with, with that wild space, then you'll never know its loss. Well, Ed, you've uh, given all of us, and I mean all the people who have seen your art throughout the world, a much better understanding of the planet that we are living on and maybe not doing our best to manage. But you've done it while also creating magnificent art, and that's a very rare achievement. So 
Thank you very much for sharing this time with us on Canada Files. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time with more Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of Donna and Richard Ivey, as well as the following donors. The Browning Watt Foundation, Nona MacDonald Heeslip, Joe and Marie Heffernan, Michael and Mary Ellen Hogan, Alice and Ted Kernahan, Richard and Gail McGraw, the Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, the North Pine Foundation, Eleanor and Francis Shen, the 63 Foundation, John and Margaret Deeks, Wendy Deeks, in memory of Peter A. Deeks, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.